On the Technique of Acting Abridged by Michael Chekhov, read by Vincent Bagnall. Michael Chekhov was one of the most extraordinary actors and teachers of the 20th century. From his professional debut at the Moscow Art Theater's experimental first studio in 1913 until his death in Hollywood 42 years later, in the early part of his career, critics, who had never seen such a seamless and startling mix of deeply emoted realism within a portrayal of grotesque fantasy, even questioned whether what Chekhov did on the stage was actually acting. It was as if the real characters from the pages of Shakespeare, Gogol, Dickens, Dostoevsky, and Strindberg had mysteriously dropped down to earth momentarily interacting with other performers, who then appeared wooden and stage-bound. Michael Chekhov also had the unusual capacity to enthuse and excite some of Europe's and America's greatest stage and film practitioners, from celebrated directors like Yevgeny Vakhtangov and Max Reinhardt to established Broadway and Hollywood actors like Stella Adler and Gregory Peck. Marilyn Monroe once called Chekhov the most powerful spiritual influence in her life after Abraham Lincoln. Yul Brenner confessed that Chekhov opened all the doors of theatrical art for him at the very beginning of his studies. And during the 20s and 30s, Konstantin Stanislavski frequently referred to Chekhov, a radical challenger to Stanislavski's own system of modern acting, as his most brilliant student. Imagination and concentration. Man feels himself younger and younger the more he enters into the world of imagination. He knows now that it was only the intellect which made him stiff and aged in his soul expression. Rudolf Meyer, The Creative Imagination. At night, when we are alone, in our bedrooms. Sharp images often emerge from the darkness, and before our mind's eye the events of the day mysteriously appear. The faces of people we have seen, their conversations and mannerisms, the streets of a city or the fields of the countryside, suddenly reveal themselves. Mostly we look passively at these familiar pictures, but among them appear strange visions unknown to us. Scenes, moods, events, and people with which we have no connection intermingle with our everyday mental images and branch out in all directions. The new images seem to develop and transform themselves independent of our control or wishes. And when this occurs, we are drawn into another realm. We may discover ourselves pursuing some mysterious phantom solving non-existent problems, or traveling in a foreign country, speaking with strangers, seeing the fantastic arising from nowhere, often beckoning, sometimes repelling. We watch things happen. We spy on whole situations that grow from nothing. As the curious images become stronger and stronger, they lead us sometimes into laughter or tears, into joy or sorrow. The whole range of our feelings finally is aroused. Glimpses of this unfamiliar terrain lead us to believe that our images have a certain existence of their own, that they come from another world. And this is even apparent when we train ourselves to perform conscious work upon our creative imagination. Artists in every field affirm that such images surround them, not only after the day is over, when solitude and night come, but also during the day, when the sun shines in the noisy city or in a small room everywhere. Artists live with their images. They and their images belong to each other, depend upon each other, and yet the images have an independent existence of their own. The great German director Max Reinhardt confessed, I am always surrounded by images. Charles Dickens wrote in his journal, I have been sitting here in my study all morning waiting for Oliver Twist who has not yet arrived. Goethe declared that inspiring images must appear before us as God's children and call to us, We are here! Raphael saw an image moving within his room that later became the Sistine Madonna on his canvas. Michelangelo complained despairingly that images pursued him and forced him to sculpt in all sorts of materials, even solid rock. How can we question the beliefs of these master artists and writers that their imaginative life came to them from outside themselves? 
And would they not scorn the narrow conception of creativity that relies solely upon personal memories and efforts? They would undoubtedly feel that today we deny our communication with the objective world of imagination, in direct contrast to their free excursions into it. The creative impulse of the masters was an expansion toward the world beyond them, while ours is often a contraction within ourselves. The old masters of European and Asian culture might even shout to us, look at your creations. They are not confined to reproductions of our petty personal lives, desires, and limited surroundings. Unlike the artists of today, we forgot our individual selves in order to be conscious and active servants of otherworldly images. Truly, we did not want to be slaves to these unguided visions, but in our work, we incorporated them like an unexpected blessing. Why are you then creating so many specimens of ugliness, disease, and chaotic contortions? Is it not simply because you are too concerned with yourselves alone and not your art? The conviction that there is an objective world in which our images lead their independent life widens our horizon and strengthens our creative will. Developing and assuming new conceptions concerning the creative process in art is the way for the artist to grow and to understand his or her talent. And one of these new conceptions is the objective existence of the world of the artist's creative images. What is the reward of artists brave enough to acknowledge the objectivity of the world of the imagination? They free themselves from the constant pressure of their too personal, too intellectual interference with the creative process, the greater part of which is intensely personal and takes place in the sphere that lies beyond the intellect. Great artists of the past and the present in acknowledging the innate laws governing the imagination also accept the necessity of waiting patiently until the image has matured to its highest expressiveness. Leonardo da Vinci waited years before he could envision the head of Christ in his Last Supper, and Goethe tells us that he bore the idea for one of his works with him for forty years before it was ripe for expression. Such a protracted period of time is, of course, impractical for the artist of today, yet in principle it is an admonition to modern actors who, in their haste, have lost touch with their imagination and consequently with the ripeness of its images. Let us not suppose that this necessity to wait, to pause inwardly before the image is a passive state. On the contrary, the truly awakened imagination is in constant fiery activity. What did the great masters of the past do while observing the ripening of their images? They collaborated with them through their fiery gaze, their creative urging attention. They saw what they wanted to see, and in the lay, the power of their gaze. But they also enjoyed the independent activity of their images, which transformed themselves under their questioning look, acquiring new qualities, feelings, desires, manifesting novel situations, symbolizing new ideas, revealing fresh rhythms. Thus they worked consciously hand in hand with their images. For artists with mature imaginations, images are living beings, as real to their mind's eyes as things around us are visible to the physical eyes. And through the appearance of these living beings, artists see in inner life. They experience with them their happiness and sorrows. They laugh and cry with them, and they share the fire of their feelings. Look, for instance, upon such creations as King Lear on the health, or King Claudius in the chapel. Shakespeare, watching these images, must have witnessed in them an intense emotional storm. Michelangelo, when creating his Moses, must have been overwhelmed by the inner power of his image to force the medium of stone to such an effortless pitch. Not only did he see the muscles and sinews, the folds of cloth, the waves of hair and beard of his Moses, but he saw before his mind's eye 
the inner might that molded all the muscles, folds and waves in their rhythmical interplay. Why would Leonardo da Vinci have once exclaimed, where there is the most intense power of feeling, there is the greatest martyr, if he himself had not been burned by the fiery life of his images? This inner life of the images, and not the personal and tiny experiential resources of the actor, should be elaborated on the stage and shown to the audience. This life is rich and revealing for the audience as well as for the actor himself. Ethel Beaulieu wrote, You will see images as in a vision mirrored in your imagination. You will give them form, substance, and reality. But you will never know quite whence they come. They are greater than yourself. And when you see them manifest a symbol, they will have a life of their own which is not your life, a mind which is not the reflection of your own. It is then that you will ask yourself, what is this that I have brought into being? And the profounder their meaning and significance, the more you will question. The acceptance of this independent world of imagination, the ability to penetrate through the outer appearance of the vision into its inner fiery life, the habit of waiting actively until the image is right, brings the artist to the verge of discovering new and hitherto hidden things. Undoubtedly, the image of Moses brought new creative insight to Michelangelo. Percival occupies, Percival occupies me very much, wrote Richard Wagner, namely a peculiar creature, a fascinating world demoniac woman always livelier appears before me. And this is the process of acquiring new knowledge through the imagination. Through painting the Last Supper, surely da Vinci increased his divine understanding and thus put forth his private philosophy that good men always seek knowledge. This longing for knowledge makes the real artist brave. He never adheres to the first image that appears to him because he knows that this is not necessarily the richest and more correct. He sacrifices one image for another more intense, and he does this repeatedly until new and unknown visions strike him with their revealing spell. Poor indeed is the imagination that leaves the artist's mind cold. And poor indeed is the influx of wisdom to such an artist when one hears him say, I have built my art upon my convictions. Would it not be better for an artist to say that he has built his convictions upon his art? But this is only true of the artist who is really gifted. Haven't we noticed that the less talented the person is, the earlier he forms his convictions, and the longer he tenaciously clings to them? The more the artist develops his ability to imagine, the more he comes to the conclusion that there is something in this process that somehow resembles the process of logical thinking. He sees more and more that his images follow with a certain inner regularity, although they remain entirely free and flexible. They become, in Goethe's words, exact fantasy. It is of great importance for the actor to develop a kind of instinct which will show him where to deviate from the sound logic of his images. Thinking and reasoning alone will not help him. The sense of truth is the principle that counts. And this sense has been lost in our time, but it can be developed again. Perhaps it will take a long time for the actor to discover noticeable results in himself. But the way itself is a simple and pleasant one. The creations of great masters of the past can again render us their kind service and help us achieve these results. Exercise 1. Look at any classical architecture forms of different styles. Reproductions will do for this purpose. Study them. Follow their lines, forms, dimensions. Try to experience their weight the interplay of the powers of gravity in them. Study the connections between separate parts of the whole architectural form. Try to guess their function, whether it be to support, to lift, to suspend, and so forth. What is the main character of the whole? Is it stressing upward? Does it cover and protect? Is it inclined to remain near the ground? Does it want to vibrate, to fly away, to spread itself, to contract? 
You do not need to study any professional books on architecture for such an exercise. It is even better if you do it freely and intuitively. Thus you will find many ways to penetrate deeply into the architectural form and to experience it. But most of all, enjoy its beauty. Then, after having become a good friend of the whole thing, suddenly ask yourself, how would it look if this pillar were twice as thin as it is, if the tower were three times lower, the arch became the square, the roof flat, the window broad, and so on. From such questioning, you will receive a shock, sometimes even a humorous one. You can do something similar with classical sculpture and painting by trying to change the forms and colors. Exercise two. Then go to Shakespeare's works, and after reading or studying one of his dramas, ask yourself some basic questions concerning the play's plot. For instance, ask yourself how it would be if a fellow in the middle of the play suddenly understood that Iago had deceived him. What if the performance that Hamlet arranges in the castle should make no impression on Claudius? What if Olivia, in Twelfth Night, were really deeply depressed by her brother's death? Ask yourself many such questions. Exercise 3. The best material for developing a good sense of artistic truth is offered in authentic folk or fairy tales. They depict destinies, suffering, heroism, downfalls, growth and development, mistakes, inner defeats, and final victories of individuals and mankind. They are true human psychology, true history, and they prophecy in tragic and humorous pictures. Their source was never a purely aesthetic or poetic one. Fairy tales have their concrete logic because they arise from the time when the wisdom of humanity was fixed in the images and symbols that we find in fairy tales. They are not arbitrary because they were seen by the ancients as the outer expression of inner truth and wisdom. Rudolf Meyer expressed this elegantly. The fairy tale and its ancient motives comes through the rise and fall of people and through the rise and fall of different world outlooks. Read or recreate a fairy tale, but do not ask questions as before. The images and events will, of their own volition, work in your creative subconscious, gradually implanting a sense of truth in you. Rudolf Meyer was born in 1896, and he was a popular German philosopher during the 20s and an art historian associated with German romanticism in Indian art. Read or create a fairy tale, but do not ask questions as before. The images and events will of their own volition work in your creative subconscious, gradually implanting a sense of truth in you. Now, if you feel yourself advanced enough in this way, read the biographies of notable people. Follow their destinies by imagining their lives. Let their destinies live in you for days and even weeks. The wisdom of it will continuously increase and refine your sense of truth. You mustn't say that you do not believe in an objective wisdom interfering with human fate. As a private person, you may or may not believe it, but as an artist, as an actor, you have to accept this point of view. On the stage, you have to deal with the destinies of your characters. And if you want to play a character in a fine, masterly way, you must conceive it as a panorama of destiny. Yes, you would do well to continue such exercises until you discover that images which are accidentally and arbitrarily put together react upon you as tasteless and amateurish productions. Concentration. How can the actor keep his grasp firmly on the turbulent world of fiery images? From where shall he take the strength to fix these movable, flexible images? The ability to concentrate his attention to the highest degree, that is his strength. Every one of us has the ability to concentrate, and all of us use it constantly. We cannot even cross the street without it. 
For the creative process, however, it is not enough to use this everyday degree of concentration. Keep in mind that there is no limit to the extent to which this power can be developed. Exercise 4. Start by looking at an object. Describe it to yourself inwardly. Is it broad and low? Is it long and high? Is it of wood or metal? Is it fluid, static, or mobile? Concentrate your attention on it. Try to acquire continuity of attention. As you concentrate, do not miss any qualities or details. Certain gaps or distractions will appear to undermine your concentration. Firmly avoid them and continue. Then, do the same with an audible object. Exercise 5. Then concentrate on any known thing, an object or a sound, that you remember but that is not perceptible at the moment of the exercise. Apply the same conditions as you did before. Now, imagine and concentrate on fantastic objects, flowers, beings, landscapes, abstract forms, and so on. Imagine noises for instant wind, storm, waves, crowded streets, factories, melodies, voices, spoken words and sentences, and concentrate on them. Try to imagine fantastic sounds. Exercise 6. Concentrate again on the same objects. First visible and then imaginary. This time, inwardly embrace the object. As fully as possible, grasp the object as though with invisible hands. Send out your whole inner being toward it. Experience your connection with the object in your arms, legs, torso. Let your whole being, as it were, participate in this embrace. This will lead you to a sense of merging with the object. At the same time, release any physical tension that may arise. Concentration is an inner event. Remain free and unstrained in your body, your eyes, your face, and even your brain. Exercise 7. Proceed with all the above-mentioned exercises in the following way. When you feel that the contact with the object is firmly established, when it has been grasped and held by you in your invisible hands, Begin to do things that have no relation to the object of your concentration. Start to move things in the room, to speak with somebody, to find a hidden thing, to open a certain page in a book, and so forth. While doing so, try to maintain the inner bonds that connect you with the object of your concentration. During such exercises, you may have similar experiences to those you have had when waiting concentratedly for days for somebody to come or something to happen while the ordinary trend of your life followed its own course without interruption. The actor who can concentrate well makes a stronger impression upon the audience because all his acting becomes clearly shaped, sure, and explicit. Vagueness disappears in his behavior on the stage and his presence on the boards grows more and more impressive. I remember a gala performance demonstration in Konstantin Stanislavski's own home, given before a selected audience in a festive atmosphere. Among the chairs was one in the middle, waiting. Among the chairs was one in the middle, waiting for a distinguished guest whom Stanislavski had chosen to honor specially. But the guest was delayed, and the performance could not begin. Impatiently, Stanislavski looked at the curtain. His whole attention was focused on the preparations going on behind it, while toward the rest of his surroundings he was naturally distracted. Suddenly, a happy smile flashed over the face of the white-haired master. With outstretched arms, he rushed toward the crowded door and led the guest to the chair, forced him, in spite of his humble protests, to accept the place of honor, and gave the sign for the curtain to be raised. All eyes were turned toward the chair in which sat a little man, the chauffeur of the long-expected guest. With his mind so concentrated on the performance, Stanislavski had completely forgotten that the honored guest was not a man at all. It was a lady. Now, such a prize was often paid by Stanislavski for his extraordinary power of concentration. Therefore, don't do your exercises on concentration while walking along the street. 
imagination and concentration. Now, the more we are able to sustain a strong bond of concentration with visible and invisible objects to which we direct our attention, the closer we will approach an understanding of the nature of real imagination. The following exercise will combine practice in both concentration and imagination. Flexibility of images. The flexibility of our images is one of their most important qualities. These images must be able to influence and lead each other, to change themselves, merge with each other, to follow their own logic freely, inspiring, suggesting, and enriching us at the same time. Exercise 8. Imagine events of mobility and transformation. A castle transforming under a spell. A poor beggar woman turning into a witch. A princess becoming a spider. A young person slowly aging and vice versa. A seed growing into a tree. A winter landscape changing into a summer one, and so on. But do not skip any of these stages of transformation. The next exercise will help you to develop the ability to wait actively, as we've described before. Exercise 9. Choose any episode in a fairy tale. Imagine it fully. Leave it until the following day. Then return to the imaginary episode. After such a period of secret growth, the images will have moved on to new situations, fresh inner attitudes, bringing with them new contributions from their own world. Now, look for more complicated, more detailed fulfillment. Before putting the images aside, set before them definite tasks, such as show more characteristics, Show more development in a good or evil way. Become older, become younger, become more passionate or calm. Reveal the costume, the inner attitude, the kind of movement. These questions are arbitrary. Then, return to the images on the third day, the fourth, and so on, prompting them to fulfill more and more tasks. The images of this exercise pass through two phases. The first, in which they are deeply influenced by your creative gaze, and the second, in which they develop independently with your assistance. Discard the first images. Now, it must be remembered that courage is needed to discard first images and to resist being too easily satisfied. What's already been found will never be lost, but will be transformed and purified in one's subconscious. Thus the standard of the actor's imagination will grow and with it a love for completion in which actors of our time are so lacking. It will also become a great stimulus for the imagination to reveal to us new and unfound things. Exercise 10. Choose any character from a play or a fairy tale. Elaborate it in your imagination as clearly as possible. Then, discard it and start from the beginning, trying to make it more complete, expressive, and original. Now, you must be very familiar with the play or fairy tale from which you've taken your image. Otherwise, you will not have the guiding motive with which to improve it. The completion of the image must be measured from the point of view of the whole play or fairy tale to which it belongs. Having discarded your first image, do not force it to disappear completely. This is impossible and unnecessary. Such an effort might even interfere with your attempt to create a second, better image. The first image will disappear slowly and perhaps completely as the second one grows. Usually the first image leaves with the second its best features. Go on discarding one image after another in this way as long as you feel inner satisfaction from this exercise. Then take another image do this intensively, but unhurriedly, for many days. After you've achieved a certain skill in discarding and improving images, try to create an original image, real or fantastic. Work with it.
in the same way you have with the previous images. In this instant, you will have a different criterion for the improvement of the image. Before you had the play or fairy tale by which to judge whether the image was truly complete, while now you have to improve it according to your own conception of it. You may be unaware of the full details of your conceived idea, but you will feel that it is your artistic taste urging you to change the image in this or that direction. The Higher Ego When I was very young, I used to say, I. Later on, I said, I and Mozart. Then, Mozart and I. Now I say, Mozart. Charles Gounod Our artistic natures have two aspects. One that is merely sufficient for our ordinary existence, and another of a higher order that marshals the creative powers in us. By accepting the objective world of the imagination, the independent interplay of our images, and the depth of the subconscious activity in our creative lives, we open up the very limited boundaries of our personalities. We confront the higher ego. Both of these two functions are clearly perceptible in a developed artist. How often is his day-to-day -day life unexpectedly simple, in contrast to his professional life, in which he is an exceptional individuality? Anton Chekhov collected one Kopeck coins with the utmost seriousness. Maxim Gorky could not stand people looking at him. I saw Stanislavski obsessively dusting chairs, tables, and shelves in his apartment without any apparent necessity for it. Yevgeny Vaktangov played simple tunes on the mandolin for hours without ever achieving any great heights in this art. But the usual ego is not what stirs our imagination. It is the other, the higher ego, the artist in us that stands behind all our creative processes. The more an artist recognizes this higher function in himself, the more he's influenced by it in his creative work. To turn our consciousness upon it, to see the concreteness of its specific powers and qualities, is a means of strengthening our connection with it. Let us therefore discuss four main ways in which our higher ego can influence our practical artistic work. Suppose a group of painters sat before the same landscape with their paints, and each promised himself faithfully to record the view before him. What would be the result? Several entirely different pictures would emerge. Why is this so? Because the artists did not paint the landscape, but their own individual conception of it one made possible by each painter's creative individuality. They painted exactly the same subject, but they did not render the landscape that they saw outwardly. They painted the landscape within themselves. The voice of each artist's creative individuality inspired his particular interpretation. Their pictures will tell us that one of them was more charmed by the atmosphere of the landscape, another by the beauty of the form and line, the third by the language of contrasts, and so on. How often has Iphigenia been written? And still, each interpretation is different wrote Goethe, and this is because each sees and expresses the thing differently in accordance with this artistic perception. The same is true of the stage. We often hear it said, for instance, that there is only one Hamlet, the one that Shakespeare created. But who knows what Shakespeare's Hamlet was? 
The actor who venerates Shakespeare and reproduces his characters exactly without individual deviations may become like the musician who idolized Beethoven to such an extent that he finally ceased to play his music because he was afraid of an inexact reproduction of Beethoven's ideas. The actor will more adequately express his reverence for Shakespeare if he allows the spark of his individual fire to be kindled by Shakespeare's flame instead of psychophantically and coolly obeying him by giving an impersonal recitation of Shakespeare's text from the stage. I once revealed to a celebrated Russian writer my theatrical conception of considering Hamlet's destiny as being enclosed between two worlds, starting with the meeting of the spirit of his father when his sole attitude is directed toward a higher being and an unknown world. Hamlet finishes by looking downward into the grave, meditating on the nothingness of human existence. Now, how exciting it would be to follow the composition of the events of Hamlet's destiny enclosed in the frame of these two polarities. The famous writer asked ironically, do you think that Shakespeare was of your opinion? There is no answer for this dry intellectual point of view. With all modesty, the actor must have his own approach to what he is going to create. On another occasion, I observed the psychology of an actor who is constantly drawn to evil, negative characters. And strangely enough, the more expressively he performed them, the more sympathetic they became, remaining nevertheless unmistakably evil. His secret became clear when I understood that the basic aim of his creative individuality was to vindicate the human condition. Speaking of a French poet, Goethe maintained, he has found common recognition not because of his poetic value, but because of the greatness of his character, which stands out from all his writings. The style of the writer, he continued, is a true expression of his inner being. The same note is heard when Goethe spoke of Shakespeare as a being of the higher order. This aim of our creative individuality is not to be confused with propaganda, which is a preconceived and schematically devised and fixed expression. This confusion can lead to such extremes in the theater as one Soviet production of Hamlet, which ridiculed the idea of monarchy, court, and aristocracy. Hamlet was played as a brutal, dirty lad with crown askew and a squalling pig under his arm, while Ophelia was a drunken prostitute. But the true voice of the creative individuality does not normally lead one to approach each complicated part with the idea of performing the hero, just as I am in my everyday life, whether the character be Faust, Lear, Hamlet, or any other. This is a way of simply avoiding any approach to the problem. Freeing and stimulating our creative individuality can be helped by exercises such as the following. Exercise 11. Study a character that you think you could act until you are familiar with it. Then, try to imagine it as performed by different actors whom you know well. Observing the acting of the same part by different creative individualities, try to see wherein lies the difference in their acting. What features of the character become more marked in each of these cases? Which is more sympathetic? Which less? And so on. You will gradually learn to see the creative individualities of the actors through the mask of the character. Conclude this exercise by acting the same part yourself in your imagination. Here you will experience something like a meeting with your own creative individuality as a contrast to all others. Remember not to analyze your creative individuality. Confine yourself to experiencing it. Exercise 12. Choose some very simple business like cleaning a room, finding a lost article, setting the table. Repeat this action at least 20 or 30 times. Each time, avoid repetition of any kind. Do each action in a new way with a fresh inner approach. Keep only the general business as a spine for the exercise. By doing this exercise, you will develop your originality and ingenuity, and with them, 
you will gradually awaken the courage of your individual approach to all that you do on the stage. As a result, you will later on be able to improvise on the stage quite freely at all times. And this means that you will always find new individual ways to fulfill old business. Remaining within the frame given by the director, you will discover gradually that the real beauty of our art, if based on the activity of the creative individuality, is constant improvisation. discernment of good and evil. Now, for the second function of our higher ego, everything in our art is built on the dynamic of the constant conflict between good and evil. And this may seem to be an obvious truth, but consider how often we see artists as well as people in everyday life who are inclined to worship power as such and to become intoxicated by it without distinguishing what kind of power it is. It's well known that this acceptance of unqualified and limitless control over others is detrimental to our social order. It is not so obvious to the actor in his own sphere, however, that the inability to distinguish between good and evil makes his character flat on the stage. He misses all the various nuances in his performance and forces himself to bluntly express the notion of power in general. All sorts of cliches, bodily tensions, and so on creep into the actor's work. He loses the aim of the author, which is always hidden behind the fight between good and evil in whatever form it may appear. He kills the ethical aspect of the play. He makes himself, the author, and the performance foreign to the present time in which good and evil, right and wrong, are burning problems and driving factors. He enfeebles the sense of truth in contemporary society. On the other hand, good and evil, if they find response and comprehension, can give the actor the key to the very heart, the dynamic and inner composition of the play and of acting itself. The ability to distinguish between good and evil is also the function of our higher ego. This ability can be increased by means of exercises. Exercise 13. Again, appeal to your creative imagination, but this time your task will be to find out what particular kind of positive or negative impulses are conflicting in a play. What kind of evil is represented in King Claudius, Cornwall, Edmund, Iago, Polonius, Richard III? What and how positive are the characters opposing them? In what way is this opposition expressed? What possibilities for positive qualities lie in King Claudius, Caliban, and Rosencrantz? Wherein lies the charm of Edmund, Iago, Malvolio, Falstaff, Queen Anne, and Gertrude? Not only will innumerable nuances become clear to you through such practice, but you will also see the meaning of artistic disguise when evil hides behind the mask of good and good glimmers through the mask of evil. You will see that there never can be unqualified good and evil on the stage. By the same token, there cannot be undifferentiated power. Each manifestation of power speaks about a definite form of good and evil, the variety and interplay of which is unlimited contemporary life. Now, let us speak about the third function of our higher ego. Since life, especially our contemporary life, is the manifestation of an enormous war between good and evil expressed in countless variations, the actor must ask himself how he can relate his art to this panorama of struggle. It is through the medium of the spectator that we find a full creative approach that links us to the world and its times. 
Vaktangov was asked how his suggestions as a director were embodied in the play in a manner that was inevitably conveyed to the audience. His answer was, I never direct before an empty audience room. From the first rehearsal, I imagine the theater filled with the audience. When giving my suggestions or demonstrating to the actor this or that passage, I hear and see clearly the reaction of the imaginary audience and reckon with it. And very often, I quarrel with the imaginary audience and insist upon my point of view. Vaktangov knew only too well that people often want to experience something other than that which they need to experience. A contrasting example is found in a well-known playwright who was reading his new play to a group of friends, and he started reading with calm assurance, clearly and expressively, and soon he came to a highly dramatic incident. His voice trembled, but he overcame it and went on. Soon, however, he was forced to pause and drink a glass of water, and long before his listeners understood where in the real drama lay, they heard sobs from the author and tears poured down his cheeks. At the end, he was openly and sincerely crying, but completely swallowing the text at the same time. The comparison is clear. Vaktangov created for the audience the playwright for himself. No doubt his drama was deeply moving, but it did not come through because he wrote it without any connection with an audience. Vaktangov grew and developed because he was in contact with his contemporaries. His profession became for him a part of the social life of his time, and the audience became for him the transmitter of public opinion. He listened to it and kept pace with his time, but was never subservient to it. Success was never for him the measurement of audience approval nor journalistic immediacy, as is so often the case. Bakhtangov was a rabid newspaper reader, but he was not looking for sensational themes that would satisfy the hungry spectator. Instead, Current and contemporary reportage was consciously combined in his mind with scenes and characters from plays. And as he read his newspapers, flashes of remote events in Shakespeare's tragedies and comedies, as well as sequences from modern plays, arose in his imagination. When he read plays, he perceived through them the incidents of life itself both appeared before him in a new light. Now, from the newspaper in his hand, he knew how he would produce or act Richard III, Hamlet, or King Lear in terms of the events of his time. All of this was because he was a strong individual who comprehended the problem of good and evil and knew how to open his consciousness to the audience and to humanity in general. Exercise 14. Concentrate on the plays, but this time you must add to your exercise an imaginary audience. You must see the theater filled with the audience, an audience of today which comes from the world of life, from its offices, its newspapers, radios, from private life, from its colleges, factories, political affairs, and so on. And before this imaginary audience, you must act or direct your plays and ask certain definite questions. What is the purpose of this play in our present time? What will the audience derive from it? What feelings, thoughts, and will impulses will it arouse in a contemporary spectator? Will it drug the audience and make it indifferent to the events of contemporary life with all its conflicts? Or will it arouse in the audience a protest against negative powers? Does it amuse the audience by inflaming its lower feelings? Or does it call upon its sense of humor and refresh it with a sound laughter, as do Shakespeare's comedies? Which aspect of the play and characters must be stressed 
in the production of the play and which should be made less significant in order to achieve a positive result for a contemporary audience. How will the audience leave the theater after the performance? And will it be provoked by the performance to act in the world? The modern director and actor must know the audience. It's power and weakness, it's leading and misleading influences. It cannot be dependent upon the second-hand opinions of specialists, but must be based upon the personal experience of meeting the audience in imagination and in reality. Only then will the director or actor hear the powerful voice of public opinion and be able to struggle with it, if necessary, to the extent that he has awakened his own higher self. He will feel himself tuned to the pulse of his times. The objectivity of humor. Now, the more conscientiously we develop our higher ego, the more this grants us the faculty of humor. And when we can detach our immediate egotistical reactions from everyday emotional events and interactions, they often reveal themselves in a really humorous light. The more our higher self is trained, the more likely we are to leave personal things behind us. We become objective in our perceptions as the artist should. Many things that previously excited us emotionally and therefore hid from us, their humorous features now show themselves completely. The higher ego frees humor in us by freeing us from ourselves. Of course, not all laughter comes from the developed self and not all giggling is laughter. An illustration of this point, Anton Chekhov was able totally to forget his self-interest in normal surroundings. His care for others often overstepped even the limits of reason. He allowed himself, for instance, to be tortured for hours by visitors whose only aim was to enjoy the presence of a famous man. His humor was as great as his capacity for self-denial. Therefore, he saw more than the people around him. And often his quiet, unexpected laughter brought embarrassment to others because... Humor through self-denial was not known to them. Such a man laughs easily even at himself at times when other people become irritated and angry. Once, not long before his death, Chekhov was walking along the streets of Yalta. Suddenly, a crowd of boys began to pursue him and heartlessly shout after him, Old Anton Chekhov's got consumption! Old Anton Chekhov's got consumption! They were provoked by his hollow figure with stooped shoulders and sunken yellow cheeks. What was Chekhov's reaction? A warm smile lingered on his lips. Of course it was not broad humor. It was the quality of self-denial that gave him the ability to describe children with love and great humor. Many years ago, in the depths of Russia, a hermit was living his last days. He was the last of the true religious mystics. He had spent 40 years in religious exercises and had attained great spiritual heights. I had the happy opportunity of visiting him, and never have I met, even in ordinary social life, a gayer person or one who was able to laugh so heartily, easily, and fully. His small, bent figure, his old blue eyes, radiated contagious humor, which arose purely from his higher ego. In this chapter, we've discussed the four main functions of the actor's higher ego. First, individual interpretation of the plays and parts. Second, the ability to distinguish between the powers of good and evil. Third, the relationship of the actor to the time in which he lives. And last, the objectivity of humor through the liberation of the actor from his narrow, selfish ego. All this widens the mental outlook of the actor, sharpens his perceptions, and makes his artistic work more significant. Objective atmosphere and individual feelings. Actors have differing conceptions about theatrical space. Some performers regard the stage as an empty space, occasionally crowded with sets, properties, and people, only to become vacant at other times of the day. For them, Everything in the theater must be visible and audible. Other actors know that this is not so. The stage is always filled with atmospheres, the source of ineffable moods and waves of feeling that emanate from one's surroundings. The theater, the concert hall, the circus, each has a specific and forceful atmosphere that is peculiar to it, and often it is one of these 
special atmospheres alone, independent of content or human talent, that attract spectators to the entertainment. Read the biographies of great actors, and you will see that for them, even the severely limited size of the stage was a whole world, enveloped with magical atmospheres from which they could not clearly separate themselves. After a performance, some actors spent the night in their dressing rooms or in the wings of the stage, absorbing the intoxicating atmosphere. These gifted performers were impelled to re-experience the interplay of atmospheres that embraced them when they acted. The atmospheres brought about a sense of exhilaration that strengthened their acting. Actors who outgrow the phlegmatic conception of the stage as an empty space know that atmosphere is one of their strongest means of expression, as well as an unbreakable link between them and their audiences. These artists always look instinctively for the atmospheres around them in their everyday surroundings, and they find them everywhere. Each landscape, town, street, building, room, library hall, hospital, cathedral nave, crowded restaurant, hotel lobby with its bright confusion, small house, tension-filled operating room, secluded lighthouse, corridor in a locked museum, engine room of an ocean liner, deserted farm. Each of these contains its own particular atmosphere. The seasons of the year, the hours of the day, and the fluctuation of the weather. The actor must apprehend all those atmospheres with which he has come in contact. Atmospheres for the artist are comparable to the different keys in music. They are a concrete means of expression. The performer must listen to them just as he listens to music. Atmospheres enable the actor to create the element of the play and the part that cannot be expressed otherwise. For example, imagine Romeo speaking his words of love to Juliet without the atmosphere of love. Although the spectator may understand the sublime text and enjoy the beauty of Shakespeare's verse, he or she will still miss something of the content. And what is this content? Is it love itself? All feelings require a specific atmosphere to be conveyed to the audience. Without these proper atmospheres radiating from the actor, Shakespeare's words of love, hate, despair, and hope reverberate meaninglessly in empty psychological space. Atmosphere reveals the content of the performance. The bond between actor and audience. Think of how many difficulties actors experience in establishing communication with their audience. Consider how many shallow means they employ in an effort to trick the audience's attention. The performance is in reality a mutual creation of actors and audience, and the atmosphere is an irresistible bond between actor and audience a medium with which the audience can inspire the actors by sending them waves of confidence, understanding, and love. They will respond thus if they are not compelled to look into empty psychological space. Atmosphere inspires the actor. The actor will also receive the necessary inspiration for his acting from the atmosphere directly. And just as in everyday life one speaks, moves, and acts differently when surrounded by different atmospheres, so on the stage the actor will realize that the atmosphere urges him to new nuances in his speech, movement, actions, feelings. Undoubtedly, he will enjoy the unbreakable series of improvised and unconscious details in his acting. He will not need to resort to cliches, nor will he fix his acting in a rigid way. The space, the air around the actor will always be filled with life, and this life, which is the atmosphere, will also keep him alive as long as he maintains contact with it. Even a simple imaginary experiment will convince us of all this. Exercise 15. Let us say that you are reading the scene from Hamlet, in which Horatio, the soldiers, and Hamlet himself are waiting on the terrace of Elsinore Castle for the appearance of the ghost of the dead king. Now, imagine this scene, or a section of it, with the atmosphere of tense foreboding expectation of an ominous appearance, apprehension, and gloom. Follow each gesture, each intonation of the voices, each movement of the characters. Be sure that they really are in harmony with the chosen atmosphere. 
Do it several times until you are satisfied with your little imaginary performance. Then change the atmosphere a little, for instance, to tense expectation, foreboding of an ominous appearance, but now active, fiery, vigorous. Act the same scene again in your imagination and see what changes will occur before your mind's eye in the voices, movements, actions, mise-en-scene, and other means of expression for the characters. Do it several times. Compare the second scene with your first performance and then make another change in the atmosphere. For instance, fill it with admiration for the unknown ghost. See it as stately, solemn, quiet, reserved. Observe the characters again in their imaginary acting. Compare this with the two previous performances. Make another change in the same atmosphere and so on. In doing so, try not to hurry with the results. Let the characters develop their own reactions to the subtle nuances that you make in the atmosphere. This will inspire your imaginary characters. Suddenly, you will realize that these images truly have an independent life. The same kind of work that we have just done in our imagination can be done by the actor in reality while preparing a part. And this is another means of rehearsing through which the actor will always discover new content, new meaning, new values in his part, new significant facets of the character and new means of expression. It will bring his character into full harmony with the rest of the play and with other characters. The director can organize the rehearsal period of a production so that different atmospheres within a play will be in investigated, decided upon, and rehearsed as exactly as the dialogue or mise-en-scene. The script can be marked with a succession of atmospheres. The division of the play into scenes and acts need have no connection with the division of atmospheres. These can be freely distributed to cover several speeches or an entire scene, or only a part of it, according to the interpretation of the play. As a result, the actor, instead of waiting for the inspiration of an atmosphere to accidentally come to him, will have before him a score of atmospheres that he can consciously assimilate, rehearse, and perform. The true function of the atmosphere starts even before rehearsals have begun. The actor whose training has given him a sharp sensitivity toward atmospheres will undoubtedly notice that his first and general acquaintance with the part fills him with a certain definite, all-embracing atmosphere. This experience anticipates his future creation. Actors, like other artists, experience an overwhelming sense of joy that precedes the beginning of new work. Frequently, when a writer starts a project, he may not have any definite plot or details, but simply a desire to create out of a certain atmosphere, tragic, humorous, dramatic, melodramatic, mystical, and so forth. In this general atmosphere, this musical key inspires him during the initial stage of his work. Characters, details, situations, and often, as we have said, the plot itself gradually occur before his mind's eye while he lives in this atmosphere. But although we know about this process, rarely do we pay enough attention to it. When we fail to use atmospheres consciously, an initial and important grip on our part is lost. Atmospheres at the beginning of an artistic endeavor are like a seed that contains the potential of the whole mature plant. The atmosphere, like the well-developed imagination, stirs and awakens feelings within us that are the essence of our art. One cannot live in the atmosphere of the scene or the whole play without immediately reacting to it with one's feelings. The feelings, in this case, arise organically of themselves without being forced or squeezed out of our soul. Although the atmosphere is akin to our personal feelings and individual moods, it nevertheless differs from them greatly. Imagine, for instance, a group of people, each with his own mood, entering an old castle where every stone, cornice, staircase, doorway, every room and tower breathes the atmosphere of unspeakable charm and the mystery of a lost age. It is there objectively in the air, created by no one, dependent on no one, yet strong enough to fight even the personal mood of the person who enters into its influence. Let us take another example, a catastrophe on a crowded street. How many different personal moods are there? One person's afraid, another full of compassion, the third burns with a desire to help, a fourth is indifferent. 
but the objective atmosphere of the horror of the catastrophe prevails over all the people concerned, regardless of their personal moods. An important characteristic distinguishes the atmosphere from individual feelings, and this is its objective existence outside of the individual. If we usually speak of personal feelings as coming from within the individual and radiating themselves into his surroundings, so in speaking of an atmosphere, we have to imagine this process reversed. The objective feelings of an atmosphere are coming from outside and are radiating themselves into the individual realm of feelings. Although both individual and objective feelings may be different and even belong to different realms, one comes from within, the other from without. Often both are present at the same time and in the same space. And that is what our experience shows us in innumerable instances in life as well as on the stage. For instance, you may enter a room in which a gay, festive atmosphere will envelop you, but your personal mood may be gloomy and depressed. Now, let us go on to some exercises for acquiring the technique of mastering the objective atmosphere. Exercise 16. Imagine the air around you, or a theater space filled with the atmosphere that you've chosen. It is no more difficult than imagining the air filled with light, dust, fragrance, smoke, mist, and so on. You must not ask yourself, how can the air be filled with fear or joy, tenderness, or horror? You must try it practically. Your first effort will show immediately how simple it is. What you have to learn is how to sustain the imaginary atmosphere that now envelops you. Your main aid will be a developed concentration. In this exercise, you do not need to imagine any special circumstances or events to justify the atmosphere. It will only distract your attention and make the exercise unnecessarily complicated. Do it as simply as described earlier. After a certain period of time, when you feel sure of being able to imagine and sustain the atmosphere around you, proceed to the next step. Try to Relate the reaction inside you to that of the imaginary atmosphere outside. Do not force yourself to feel anything. Simply realize the reaction, which will appear of itself if the first part of this exercise has been carefully and patiently done. The whole value of this exercise will be lost if you impatiently impose the reaction upon yourself instead of letting it grow freely. In the beginning, this exercise may take time, but very soon you will see that the process of creating the atmosphere and reacting to it is almost instantaneous. Gradually, the atmosphere will penetrate deeper and deeper into the realm of your emotions. Exercise 17. Now, move and speak within the atmosphere. Start with simple movements and a few words, trying to establish full harmony between them and the atmosphere. Frequently, we are able to maintain a strong atmosphere if we are silent and motionless, but as soon as we speak or make a movement, we are inclined to destroy it. The atmosphere must remain around you, and your movements and words must be born out of it. The harmony will be achieved more easily and organically if you avoid any pretension, any attempts to perform such harmony as if someone were looking at you. Strive for the harmony sincerely and honestly for the sake of the harmony itself, but not in order to show off. Movements and words may gradually become more complicated. And finally, you may choose short moments from actual plays and use them for your scenes. Soon you will reach the point where your speech and movements will intensify rather than diminish the atmosphere. You can strengthen this result by making the effort to radiate the inner life that has been awakened in you through the objective atmosphere. To summarize, number one, imagine the air around you filled with a certain atmosphere. Two, become aware of the reaction within you. Three, move and speak in harmony with the atmosphere. And four, radiate it back into the space around you. Inner dynamic. The more an actor advances in acquiring the technique described above, the more he becomes aware of a certain peculiarity about atmosphere. He begins to realize that it is never static but dynamic, that it is a process rather than a state. It lives and moves constantly, although this movement is a purely inward, invisible, psychological one. If, for example, the actor lives in a depressing atmosphere, he definitely feels the pressure as an act, a process, or a movement that goes on unceasingly as long as the atmosphere lasts. 
If the actor, through exercises, has really acquired a sense of inner dynamic, it will become for him an urging power, an impulse, an inspiration for his imagination and acting. In atmospheres such as catastrophe, panic, haste, excitement, gay festivity, etc., the inner movement, the urging power, is obvious. But what of atmospheres such as the tranquility of a forgotten cemetery, the comfort of a warm room, the peace of a summer evening, here, the inner dynamic is not so apparent, yet for a sensitive actor it exists in these apparently passive atmospheres, even as in those more energetic ones. The experienced performer knows and loves the cataleptic power of the atmosphere which awakens his activity. He needs it on the stage if the theater is to represent an expanded life for him and not merely a feeble reproduction of his usual surroundings. The layman, the non-actor, surrounded by the atmosphere of a moonlit summer evening, will remain impassive while the actor, inspired by it, will start to act, at first perhaps in his imagination and then perhaps outwardly too. Images born out of the inner dynamic of the atmosphere will surround him. He will absorb this hidden dynamic and will transform it into events, characters, words, and movements. Mission of Atmosphere Deprived of atmosphere, a performance becomes greatly mechanized. It can be intellectually understood, so um, its technical skill can be appreciated, and yet it will remain cold and heartless. And this obvious fact is often obscured by the individual feelings of actors flashing here and there during the performance, but separate actors are only parts of the whole and have to be united with each other and with the audience to create a performance that is an organic whole. How can they do this if they are not enveloped in one atmosphere? The best way to create a chaotic performance is to cast a play exclusively with stars and to let them display their brilliant abilities freely. As we know, art itself lives primarily in the realm of feelings. The atmosphere, which also belongs to this realm, is the heartbeat of every piece of art and is also the lifeblood of each performance. In a materialistic era such as ours, people are ashamed of their feelings. They suppress and hide them. Are they not thus in danger of losing them altogether? The great mission of the contemporary actor is to save the objective atmosphere in the theater and with it to rescue the human facet of his profession. Individual feelings. Now let us consider the individual feelings of the actor and ways to awaken them. It is possible for the imaginative actor to see the feelings of his characters and the atmospheres of the play. And this enables him to become free of his conventional and personal responses, making his feelings flexible and engulfing him in an infinite sea of surprising and varied nuances. Now the actor can receive the impulses for individual feelings from outside, but this does not exhaust the actor's possibilities of arousing and kindling his individual feelings, the source of which lies within himself and is therefore most obscure. How often the actor tries to force his feelings, to order himself to become sorrowful, gay, or happy, to hate, to love. It seems that such forcing is rarely successful. In most cases, the actor's feelings, the most valuable element in his profession, remain dormant in spite of all his efforts. And this is why he so often seeks refuge in his old theatrical habits and worn-out clichés. But since the actor's feelings cannot be commanded, are there any other means of governing them at will? There are. Action with qualities. Let us try to describe a special technique for reviving the actor's feelings. The secret lies in arousing the feelings without forcing them immediately. If we want to lift and lower our arm, we are able to do it without difficulty. We can also do the same movement, let us say, cautiously. Of course, this will not seem any more difficult to us than our previous movement, but a certain psychological tint will come into our movement, namely caution. How did this happen? Well, it slipped into our movement, unnoticed by us as a quality of caution. But what is this quality from the point of view of acting? It is nothing other than a feeling. Did we force it? No. It slipped into our movement just because we did not force ourselves to feel caution. We fulfilled our simple movement, our business, and that we can always do. Our doing, our action, is always in our will, but not our feelings. And here lies the key. The feeling was called forth, provoked, attracted indirectly by our business, doing, action. 
If we had not acted but only waited for the appearance of the feelings, perhaps they would not appear. On the other hand, if we moved and acted without coloring our action with qualities, the feelings might have remained passive. We can go on doing different movements, choosing more complicated business with more complicated qualities. We can, for instance, caress a child, speaking this or that word to it and giving our movements and voice the qualities of warmth, tenderness, and compassion. Surely we will be able to do it just as easily as the previous simple tasks we set ourselves, but the difference in this case will undoubtedly be greater. The feelings will take part in our acting to a great extent, and we can combine a number of qualities in our action. And in every case, we will get the same result. We will have at our disposal feelings, real feelings, that will follow our movements, our actions, slipping into them easily and with sufficient strength. Therefore, we can say that action with qualities is the easiest way to the living feelings. Once we have found the way to stir our feelings without forcing them, we can be sure that they will flow of themselves more often and more easily. But this cannot happen without sufficient training. Exercise 18. Make simple movements in business. Move your hands and arms in different directions. Then get up or sit down, cross the room. Take up different things, move them, and so forth. Make the same movement several times with different qualities. Calmly, fiercely, thoughtfully, angrily, hastily. Staccato, legato, painfully, decidedly, slyly, willfully, rigidly, softly, soothingly. Go on doing this simple exercise until the feelings begin to respond to the chosen qualities. Then combine your movement and business with one of Then, combine your movement and business with one or several words. The chosen qualities must color equally both business and speech. If you are working with partners, proceed to simple improvisations. Later on, even short sketches can be used. The realm of qualities is unlimited. You can take almost any noun or abstract idea, any image in your mind, and turn it into a quality for your action. Try it practically and you will see how greedily the actor's nature turns everything into feelings if you approach the problem through the right channels. Action is what. Quality is how. Until now, we have been speaking about qualities that awaken feelings when combined with actions. But what about action itself? Since the quality is connected with the feelings, so the action comes from the realm of the will. The action, the movement, the gesture, what do they express? What do they speak about? They tell us what one's will is aiming at. Just like us in our everyday life, the characters on the stage always desire something. Thing. That means that the will is always directed toward a certain goal, a certain aim. Out of this stirred will, all action, all business, every gesture emerges on the stage just as in life. The sharp, clear, definite aim of the will expresses itself in well-formed, plastically molded actions and gestures while observing such actions and gestures, we can penetrate into the will of the character and follow its impulses and aims. Now, if we ask ourselves what the difference is between action and qualities, what each is assigned when combined together, we may say the action and will expresses what happens, whereas the quality and feelings shows how it happens. Each gesture, each action one makes springs from a certain will impulse. The opposite is also true. The gesture the actor makes can stir his will. We've said that the more definite the will impulse, the more expressive the gesture. Now we can add that the better the gesture is formed, the stronger and clearer it is, the surer it will reach the will and stir, stimulate, and arouse it. A strong gesture of affirmation or denial, expansion or contraction, repulsion or attraction, will inevitably agitate the will, calling forth in it a corresponding desire, aim, wish. In other words, the will echoes the gesture, 
reacts on it. We must emphatically point out, however, that only gestures that are properly done can arouse the actor's will. He has to learn and practice making such gestures in order to be able to apply them later on to the professional work. And therefore, let us describe some exercises that lead to the correct technique for producing these gestures. Exercise 19. Start with simple observations. Look at or imagine forms of different plants and flowers. Ask yourself, what gestures do these forms conjure before me? Combine them also with qualities. For instance, a cypress streams upward, that's the gesture, and has a quiet, positive, concentrated character, quality, whereas the old, many-branched oak rising upward and sideways, gesture, will speak to us of a violent, uncontrolled, broad character, quality. The violet peeps out of its surrounding leaves, gesture, tenderly, confidently, questioningly, quality, whereas the tiger lily thrusts out of the earth, gesture, aggressively, persistently, passionately, almost shouting at us, quality. Each leaf, stone, rock, remote mountain range, cloud, brook, wave will speak to us about gestures and qualities that are contained in them. And through observations alone, you will awaken in yourself a living feeling also for each element of stage construction. You will, for instance, see different gestures, the interplay of powers and qualities in staircases, steep or sloping, in doors and windows, narrow, low, high, broad or square, in pillars, walls, corners, etc. It's amazing to see how Leonardo da Vinci experienced architectural form. An arch, he says, is nothing other than a strength caused by two weaknesses. For the arch is made up in two segments of a circle, and each of these segments, being in itself very weak, desires to fall. And as the one withstands the downfall of the other, the two weaknesses are converted into a single strength. Would it not be true to say that Leonardo da Vinci acts the arch? because in his imagination he is inside it. While exercising, you must try to do the same acting, being inside the forms you are observing, then try to make with your hands and arms the gesture that will express for you what you have experienced as gestures and qualities in different forms. Make this gesture several times until you come to the point where your will and feelings will echo your gesture. Here, as in all exercises, you must make a real effort, but the final results should not be forced. These will come of themselves if you are patient and persistent in your work. Exercise 20. Train yourself to make certain gestures with the utmost expressiveness, as fully and completely as you can. These gestures might express, for instance, drawing, pulling, pressing, lifting, throwing, crumpling, coaxing, separating, tearing, penetrating, touching, brushing away, opening, closing, breaking, taking, giving, supporting, holding back. Scratching. You can produce each of these gestures with different qualities, violently, quietly, surely, carefully, staccato, legato, tenderly, lovingly, coldly, angrily, cowardly, superficially, painfully, joyfully, thoughtfully, energetically. The suggested movements must not become a kind of acting. You must avoid pretending, for instance, that you are pulling something with difficulty and you are becoming tired. Try to adjust yourself to handle the imaginary heavy object more skillfully. Your movements of pulling, pressing, tearing, and others must maintain a pure, ideal, archetypal form. Unnecessary complications and acting additions will weaken the results of this exercise. Each movement must be as broad as possible so that your whole body and the space around you will be used to the fullest degree. The tempo in which you produce your movements must be moderate, and after each movement come to the repetition of it without haste. 
Finally, the exercise must be done with full inner activity, and yet you must not strain your muscles and body as you produce properly wide, broad, but beautifully executed movements. Through these exercises, you will revive your body so that later on, while producing smaller gestures, you will always feel as though your whole body, your whole being, takes part in them. Although your whole body need not necessarily move. And this is the point of the exercises. Your will will not react to the movements if they do not occupy and electrify your body. Another benefit of this exercise is the development of the ability to manage your body more freely than before. You will also more easily invent various gestures and movements that you will need while applying action with qualities in your professional work. Exercise 21. Perform the gestures with their qualities again. The ones you found while working on the forms of different plants, flowers, and so forth. Perhaps you will improve them now, making them simpler but stronger and more expressive. Do each of them as many times as necessary to call forth the reaction of your will and feelings. Then go on doing them, but only in your imagination, remaining outwardly immobile. See that your will and feelings react upon the imaginary gesture as they reacted upon the real one. But if the result is not yet satisfactory, return to the previous stage and make your movements visible again, alternating them with the invisible ones, and wait patiently for the result. If you do these exercises every day with the same energy, the result will show itself very soon. Until now, we've tried to describe how, by means of gestures and qualities, the actor can stir and awaken his will and feelings. We can now see how the actor can apply these means to his professional work. Afterward, looking toward a future theater. During the last years of Chekhov's work, he frequently called upon each of us actors to develop clear concepts and visualizations of what we believe an ideal theater should be for the future. He himself envisioned a theater that, among many other things, does not confuse naturalism with realism and that can entertain the public with diverse theatrical styles. Chekhov's vision of a future theater also called for a sense of moral responsibility on the part of producers, directors, and writers, as well as actors. He said they must be willing to ask what effect will our production have upon the audience? What will be stirred up within the spectators? Will what we are presenting have any positive value for them? as human beings. Chekhov wanted those who develop productions to ask themselves if the members of their audience will be strengthened in some way by what they have seen, or will they actually become weaker through their encounter with the play or screenplay. Those who have worked seriously with Michael Chekhov's technique know that each aspect, when exercised sufficiently, becomes a gift to the actor, not only as an artist, but as a human being. A gift that can become nourishment for the human spirit, given through the actor to the world.